Fellas, now's when we're starting. 22. We're just kind of a question because it has to do with other parts. says, determine whether it is possible that the following proportions are equal and explain your reasoning. The proportions of adults from exercise 21A and the proportion of adults from exercise 21B. Uh, now let's go up, back up to 21. Should we just do 21 first so that we have it? Is that going to make everything easier? <laughs> 21 says construct a 99% confidence interval for part A. How about your calculator so you can help me with this real quick and we can get 21 done pretty quick. Uh, population proportion of adults in the United States who say that climate change poses a large threat to the world. shows the results of a survey of 1,017 adults from the United States and Great Britain, so on and so on, if they believe. So those are the yeses. So in the United States, what's the percentage that say yes? Twenty-seven. In Italy, what's the percentage? 49, and in Great Britain, what's the percentage that say yes? 31. So the population proportion of adults from the United States who say uh, climate change poses a large threat. So if we're using our calculators, what did we need again on our calculators? What did we have to put in on our calculators to make our interval? Uh, <coughs> X in a common. X in and C, right? Well, we know C, they want it to be 99%, is that right? For the United States, for A, they tell you up there what was yeah. in, how many people did they survey in the United States? 1,017. Well, that's in. How can we find X? How can we figure out how many people said yes? Use the percentage. Oh, so, son. Grab your calculator. For the United States, it was 27%, so it's going to be 0.27 times that 1017. Right. 0.27 times 1017. I haven't been doing this. 274. 274. Does everybody grade that? Round up 275. 275. Now, on this one, is it really close to 274? No. So what was the 275? Right. Because this one, usually we have been rounded up regardless. This time it's just the percentage, so we're not doing that. So in your calculators, grab your calculators. We're going to put in those three. That will help us find the interval here. Everybody agree with Sean on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's about 23.5% to 30.6%. Uh, B says population proportion for adults in Italy. Doing the same thing. So the parts that are going to change for Italy, the X and the N are going to change. What's N for Italy? How many people did they survey in Italy? Thousand sixty. Sorry, that's not X. That's in. Thousand sixty. What was the percentage in Italy? So 0.49 times ten sixty. What's that give you? What is it? It's, it's Phoenix moving back up to his right desk so I can see his phone. This is kind of our phones are in the bed. All right. Thought the way he was hiding it there. Yeah. Right. Yeah, 
519.4. So we'll say about how many? Which one you want to go with? 520. 520? Sean. Uh, learn why it took so long. I didn't plug them in. I did the entire thing on. <laughs> he did the long way? Yeah. Oh, is that why you were saying it was tedious? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I thought you were saying it was tedious it. because it was so easy. As I did it, I'm thinking. Yeah, I was doing it that one way. <laughs> Plug that into your calculator. Again, C is not 0.99. What's that give us for our interval? 4, 5, 4. 4, 5, 4. 5, 5, 1. Oh, 5, 1. My fault. And then 0.530. This is Italy, right? Yeah. And I'm guessing C deals with the other one, correct? So let's do it. You need to find X and N for it. What was N for uh, Great Britain? How many people? 1,126. And the percentage for Great Britain was what? Um, 31. So 0.31. What's 0.31 times 1,126? 349.8. So about 349? Yeah. So again, C is still 0.99. Does everybody know where you're going on your calculator to punch this in? Yeah. yeah. Do we need to go over it again? Yes. Yeah. So you, Daniel, do you know seriously? All right, then I'll tell you. All right, so you go to, what do we go to first? Stat, stat. sorry, stat, then over to test. Yeah. And down, we're going to go down to one, one prop Z. One, I, I always say it backwards. One prop Z int, is that right? Yeah. Yes. It should be A on your It's like part A? Yeah, it's part A. And then when you get there, you're going to punch in these three things. What's our interval on this one? Uh, 0.345. Everybody agree with those two? Yeah. Now, to do 22, this should make it easy now we have all this right here. 22 says, uh, is it possible for the two proportions to be equal? Explain your reasoning. So, for exercise 21A and 21B, so if we went out and we did a sample of U.S. people, then we went out and we did a sample of Italian people. Is it possible for the proportions that we get for the U.S. or the proportion, the percentage we get for the U.S. to be the same as the percentage we get for Italy? Because do these two intervals cross each other at all? So no, it's not possible there because the intervals don't cross. Give me a possible percentage you could get in the U.S. 25. 25%. Would that work in Italy? No. No, because in Italy it's going to be 45 to 53%. Uh, part B says, uh, part B compared to part C. Is it possible for these two to overlap? No, again, because the intervals don't overlap. And we're saying with 99% confidence that if we take a survey, the population proportion should fall in each of those intervals. Part C, the proportion of adults from 21A and 21C. So this one and this one. Yes. Why is it possible for those to work? Because they they overlap. So give me a percentage that if we got it in the U.S., we could also get it in 28. Uh, Great Britain. 28 percent. If we got 28 percent said yes in the U.S., is that going to fall in this interval for Great Britain? Yeah. yeah. Next question. I'm 
done with phones for the year. I just had that discussion first of all. Y'all were doing taxes today. It is tax season. I mean, that's why I did it today, thinking, all right, this is a good thing for them, and they're still not paying it. <laughs> this is something they actually need. Man, we never learned about taxes or nothing. We do 23, too. 23. You what? Phoenix. So they never learned about taxes in school, but when you get taught it, they don't pay attention. In exercise 23 and 24, uh, use the following information. The table shows the results of a survey in which separate samples of 400 adults from, uh, from the east, south, midwest, and west were asked if tra traffic congestion is a serious problem in their community. Uh, construct a 95% confidence interval for the population proportions of adults. Uh, part A is in the south. Uh, we know C for both parts is 0.95, 95%. How many people, what's our N this time? They did 400 for all of them, right? Yeah. Now, for the different parts, so that's the same for both of them, or yeah, for both of them, but we need to find X for each one. Uh, in the south, what was the percentage in the south? 32. So we're going to take 400 times 0.32. Somebody do that for us. 128. So that means 128 people said yes. So in our calculators, we're going to put in X is 128, N is 400, C is 0.95, and we want the interval. So again, if we were going to interpret this, I don't know if they ask us to interpret it or not, but I'm going to interpret it. We would say something like, uh, with a 95% or with 95% confidence, we can say that the people in the what was it, the South? People in the South who say that congest traffic congestion is a problem is going to fall between 27% and 36 and or 36 point6 percent part B would they ask us for in part B from the west yeah. so we need to find X for the west what was the percentage in the west 56 percent why do you think that's so much higher than all the rest of them? Like California. California you go out there if you've ever been out there to drive it's ridiculous. So 0. 0.56 times uh, 400 is what? 224. Plug that into your calculator. This, the C is still 0. 0.95 and then still 400. 0.611 to 0.609. So on that one, between 51 and 61% of all people are going to say, yes, traffic congestion is a problem. I think that's all they ask us on that one. Other questions? Easy stuff. Take another quiz over. Not right now. Give me a week. Let me give me. Let me recover. We're gonna hit that recovery. Three classes in a row. That's kind of stuff. Shy squared. It's an election for them. Brendan, you just couldn't take it if you're in that pouch. It was too far away from me. Oh yeah. Oh, we got, got two of them. No, you got a calculator. Yeah, two. Yeah, this is the calculator you gave me.
You get old, man. Uh, <laughs> it, it would. <laughs> on this, what we're gonna cover. I'm not even gonna argue. What we're gonna cover today, a little tougher. We're gonna deal with chi squared stuff, confidence intervals for variance and standard deviation. I would write down that title. This one's a little tougher because there is no way to do this on the calculator. And I know I've lied to you in the past, Phoenix. I'm not lying to you this time. All right, there is no way you have to do this one out long end. Yeah, I just write out the title, and then I'm going to switch it here in a second. So what we're doing now, start of the chapter we did, our point of estimate was mu, and we used x bar. Then last time, our point of estimate was p, and we used p hat to get our estimate. Now we're doing variance and standard deviation. Remember, variance is sigma squared, standard deviation is sigma, and our uh, what we're going to use for those are S squared and S. That's what we're going to look at. The chi squared distribution, we're going to talk about that. Chi squared distribution, chi squared. We, we go into it some. That's a really, really, really big part. If you take this class in college, you'll go into it more than some. It'll be a whole bunch. We don't do a whole lot with the chi squared just because too hard for me. I don't feel like getting into it. That was too hard for you. So, you. so you can tell your professor that, Sean, when you get to college and you got to take this safe. Everson said the chi squared stuff was too hard for him, so he didn't go into it a whole lot, so you're going to have to teach me well. All right, what this is used for? To find out how much a population varies. Now, when we talk about a population, we're not just talking about people. When we talk about a population varying, what we're going to deal with more times than not is some item. All right? So if they're producing these glasses, they want to know how much they vary from one to the next as far as the lens goes, maybe. All right? And if it gets off too much, then no longer, I don't know, these glasses are probably like a 2.0 is what the lens is supposed to be. Magnified by 2.0 or something. I, don't, I don't just make it up stuff. Well, if it gets off and it's you know, too much one way or too much the other way, then they're lying to us when they're selling them to us. Yeah. All right? An easy one, one that Riley can understand. A bag of M&Ms. When you take a bag of M&Ms, it says on there, ounces, right? Is that always correct? If it's in or anything. Would that always be correct? Does it matter which one they put in there? Is any of them that they put on that package ever going to be exactly correct every single time? No, so what happens is the government allows them a little bit one way or the other. So if we took those bag of M&Ms and we actually weighed them every time, they're not going to, let's say they say 2.5 ounces. They're not going to actually weigh 2.5 ounces. There's going to be an interval, like we've been doing, that they fall between. And they have to fall in within that interval. If they don't fall within that interval, which happened here a few years ago, uh, the Mars company got in trouble because their candy bars were getting smaller and they were lying to everybody because they weren't changing the packaging. Right? So at first it was all right because the federal government let them be so far off one way or the other and they were staying in that range. And then all of a sudden they got to where they were below that range and people figured out they're not staying in that range anymore. We're getting ripped off. Okay? And they had to change their stuff and I think they got fined by the federal government and everything for not keeping the package in the uh, another thing, and I mentioned this once before, probably when we started this chapter. Used to be that they take, used to be the sophomores and they start going to seniors and they went on the trip to all the businesses down in Eaton and Lewisburg and stuff. 
and one of the businesses was, uh, I can't remember which business it was now, they make car parts. One of them, there's two or three different ones yeah. that make car parts. But they make car, I think it's the one, we had this discussion at the start of the year, I think in here, the back entrance, did we talk about that, the back entrance to the fairgrounds? And no, maybe that was some of the different no, classes. Huh? Right? So the factory. Yeah. So right there, I can't remember. It must have been last year that I had that discussion because no, somebody in there was going. Fairground doesn't have a back entrance. I go there all the time. Yes, it does. It's right there by there. There's a the tire company California. and stuff right down there on 35. That's not 35. The fairground's on, and they're telling the other road that it's on. And finally, I got tired of discussing it with them. But anyway. We went in there for the tour the one day, and they had a great big box full of the part that they were making. And I mentioned this to you guys. Comes when I asked the guy about it, he said the third shift guy had made all these parts, and none of them fell in the correct variance. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. And they had to throw them all out. So that whole shift was wasted, plus all the materials was wasted, and the guy said it was, he probably lost his job, I don't know, I, I didn't hang around to find out or call him again and say, hey, did you fire so and so, I didn't care that much. But when you're doing a job like that, what he had to do is they had uh, a caliper and it was set at a certain thing, and you had to see if it fell within that variance. And that's what this does. Tells you a certain range that it should fall in. This is, I wouldn't write any of this down either. So, what we're gonna look at is S squared, that standard, or uh, I'm sorry, variance for a sample. And our point of estimate is sigma squared, variance for uh, population. And then for uh, standard deviation, it's S for a sample, sigma for a population. Hopefully you remember all that. We should probably take another symbols test here real soon, shouldn't we? Um, actually, I could probably do that one. I, I might be able to ask This I would write down, chi squared. Notes aren't very long today as far as what you might need to write down. This one I would probably write all of this down. And then again, you don't have to go word for word. It's not. That little thing up there at the top that looks like an X, that's not an X. It's a fancy X. And it's called chi. All right? So it's another Greek letter. I'm probably not going to throw a big fit if Ben makes all his chi's look like X's. I'll probably know what they are. Just don't get them confused if it's you. So if you got an X and you have a chi in a problem and you get the two confused, nothing I can do about that. squared distribution, as you look at that, when you get down to the graph, you look at that chi-squared distribution, that looks different than every other distribution that we've done. All the rest of them that we've done look normal. This one actually is always going to have a tail on the right, or it's going to be positively skewed. Hopefully you remember that from earlier in the year. Not to increase the freedom. Huh? Degrees of freedom. Remember that? Yeah, that was God, I do not. We used that last time. 
don't know. All I remember was before the test was D up means degrees of freedom. That's it. That's all I remember. It's really, really tough to figure out the degrees of freedom. Yeah. Impossible. Yeah, it's almost impossible. Isn't it? Might involve taking off your shoes and sock. Count on your toes. Count on your toes. All so, right, if I got. 19, and I take one away. That'd be a lot. We got bigger problems than that. That's not good. So to figure out chi squared, chi squared equals n minus 1 on top. That's n minus 1 is the same as your what? Degrees of freedom. So it's the degrees of freedom on top divided by the variance of the population times the variance of the sample. Now, chi-squared graphs always going to look like that. It's always going to be skewed to the right or positively skewed, skewed out towards the positive side of the graph. In other words, it has that tail on the right-hand side. And it's going to have some other properties, and we're going to, those other properties will be here in the next slide or two. So again, a chi-squared graph looks like this. It's always going to have a tail out to the right, positively skewed, uh, right, uh, skewed right, however you want to say it. The larger your n is, the bigger it is, the more it looks like this. The smaller the n is, then the chi-squared graph looks, comes back this way more and stuff. So it, gets farther and farther away from that normal curve, the smaller the n is. So it's a whole family of curves that we use with our degrees of freedom, just like the last one that we did. So it could look something like this. If we have, if our n is 1, then we have this real small area here. If n is, two, uh, this says 4, then we have the green one. n is 9, you see we get a little closer to normal. If n is 15, we get a little closer to normal. The bad thing is with the normal curves, this will never be a normal curve because it's always got to be positive, and that's one of the rules uh, for a chi-squared or one of the properties of a chi-squared. So write this down. The properties of chi-squared, and you can use the symbol in there instead of writing out the words. These four things, it's always going to be positive, it's always going to be a family of curves, the area is always one still, and it's always going to be positively skewed or skewed to the right. Remember when it says skewed one way or the other, it's whichever end the tail is on, is the way it's skewed. So, so if it's skewed to the right, that means you got a tail out to the right. If it's skewed to the left, you got a tail out to the left. Does it only? Whenever I think of skewed, I think like 
That's where the data is. Right, where most of it is. I, that's sort of the way that most people think. Oh, it's skewed over here because there's more stuff over here, but that's not the way it really works. It's where that tail is. So four things that make something a chi-squared. <coughs> those are not negatives. All right. Does everybody understand that, that those are just dashes out in front? Yeah. Those are not negatives. They're supposed to be bullet points. So chi-squared always has to be positive. Unlike everything else that we've been doing that you had positives and negatives, chi-squareds are always positive. So if you come up with a chi-squared and it's negative 32.7, you did something wrong. Daniel picked a good day to come because there is no way the other stuff that you've missed, Daniel, you can do on the calculator. You can't do this one on the calculator. This one we have to do out on the next slide. Next slide is going to be the calculator oh. sure. Next week. All right, I lied to you. We can do it. Okay. If, if, if we can, I'll be surprised also. So it would be something that I didn't remember that I figured out. With chi-squareds, with chi-squareds, I would write this down and draw this. You're always going to have two critical values. So instead of the way it's been up till this point, where we had negative 1.96 and positive 1.96, that no longer works. Now you're going to have something like 5.32, 70.58. You're going to have two critical values, one on the left, one on the right. And you're going to have to figure out both of them. So anybody have a, anybody have a guess what? Chi squared L stands for left. the left critical value, chi squared R, and it's supposed to look like this. I know you can't hardly tell on mine. It's chi squared with the little subscript R is what it's supposed to be. It's hard to do that on the computer. It doesn't like the... I was just going to write it as a fraction. You might not lie. Off to the side, I'm just going to put a line between the two. So it's the... The left critical value and the right critical value. And we're going to have to use our charts here in a second. You'll need those charts out. There's a chi-squared chart in there. And we'll do something with it to show you how to find those two critical values. So get out the charts and we'll start to find them. These are the ways that you do it. Uh, I'll give you a second. Write this down. Those formulas at the bottom, very important. Usually, it's easier to find the chi-squared right. This is the one I've been mentioning this all year long. All the rest of our charts in this packet tell the area down to the left. Chi squared tells the area up to the right. So on the chart, this one's backwards from all the other charts. Those two little formulas, they aren't hard. They're going to help you find your critical values, though, and you've got to do them first. First thing, everybody needs to help Daniel out. How do you find the degrees of freedom? So you go N minus one. N minus one. Whatever your N is, minus one. That's a hard one. Go to your 
calculator under Two color proofs so in this class was easy. They weren't hard. No, so it was every single, every no, single one. Yeah, 95 on that quiz, it was super easy. We're taking that test right now. The class that was in here before you guys, that's what they were taking. Was the test of Almost every single one's the exact same thing. Exactly. It's just you put 15 of them on the homeworks. So you just write the same thing over and over. Yeah, which was easy. It was well, easy, but it was so annoying. So. What did you do back in second grade when you were doing a spelling list? Because I'm learning something I use now. Yeah, you you write the words when you were practicing for your spelling test. What did you do? You wrote the words like 15 times. It's always it's always given something, given again later in the problem, and then ends with one of the. Or like the rule or whatever, the reasons? I don't know, but the, the S, 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 S stuff, like all of that, all that was super easy. No, there were some kids who put, like, wrote it out, the whole thing. Those guys were crazy. No, they, there was Why would you just write that short? Like, you let it. us write this, like, SSS, sign, angle, sign, whatever. Oh, angle, sign. Why would you I found I had a 19 in your class one time. I had a 19% yeah, I'm at in sophomore year. I still passed. That's when that wall was from. <laughs> I still pass though. You did say that if we did really well at the start of the year, we didn't have to, didn't have to worry about the second part. But still, I didn't say you didn't have to worry about it. I said you wouldn't have you, to. You have to worry about it less. Right. You wouldn't have to do as well the second half of the year. I didn't do too well. I mean, I quiz on this. Isn't that just sort of common math knowledge that? Hey, if we average all this up, Michael. if I do really well here, I don't have to do as well here to get the grade in the middle. I mean, that's sort of common. You're fine. So, first thing you're going to do, you're going to find the DF. Then we're going to find these two. You've got to know. To find the, the chi-squared right, we need this number. 1 minus the C, which is your confidence number, 95, 99. 80, whatever it is, that answer divided by 2. Again, some of you, like on the quizzes that we've been yeah. taking, some of you are going to mess up. you got to make sure you do 1 minus that, hit equals, then hit divided by 2, otherwise it's going to give you the wrong answer. Same thing over here, instead of 1 minus C, though, it's 1 plus C. So we're going to have to find both of those. That's going to help us find our two critical values. The third thing you got to do, and sorry, my picture here looks terrible because it will not allow me hiding that Brian doesn't do any good. It's still going to get it taken for the next two years. My PowerPoint will not let me move my chi squared right and my chi squared left anymore. I don't know why. So it moved them to where it wanted them, and it won't put them, won't let me put them back in the proper spots there. Uh -huh. Just wrap them. Is that what it is? I don't know how to do that. So, so you get arrows pointing. And if you switch them around, Phoenix, it makes absolutely no difference. So if you can't follow my arrows, then as long as you put the two up here, that's all about Next thing I want you to do, once you got that written down, those are the three steps to find our two critical values. Get out your charts, flip through it, and one of them says chi-squared distribution. Find it. Chi-squared distribution. It's like table six is what it is. So on it, we're going to do those three steps. That's exactly what we're going to do, those three steps. You got your confidence interval. That's telling you the percentage that's in the center here. We're going to figure out what are the boundaries for that confidence interval. 
going to give us our chi squared left and our chi squared right boundary on each side. So to find uh, critical values for chi squared right, chi squared left for 95%, if our n is 18. So what we're going to do, if n is 18, what's your df? 17. 17. Our c is 0.95. On this chart, well, before we do the chart, each one you got to do this. You got to do these little things. So 1 minus 0.95 divided by 2, and 1 plus 0.95 divided by 2. Now, hopefully, after you do one of them, Riley, after you do a couple of these, you're going to figure out what these two are to each other, and you won't have to do them both every time. Somebody help me out. What's 1 minus 0.95? What's that give you? 0.025. 0.05 and then divide it and it's 0.025, right? Yeah. Now do this one. What's 1 plus 0.95 and then divide that by 2? 0.975. Anybody notice anything about these two? They always add up to 1. So if you find the first one, all you really got to do to find the second one is subtract it from 1. If that confuses you, then just do both those little things. They're not very difficult. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this one. Remember this is our, for the first one, this is your chi squared right. This one is for your chi squared left side. And you're going to go on the chart, on the chart look for 0.025 and our df which is 17. So we go down to 17 on the side 025 even on this chart? Yeah. Is it? So it's over there. What's it come out to be? 30.991. That's our chi squared right. Again, it's when we find them, it's usually backwards. This is the one on the right hand side. And you'll you'll see when we find the chi squared left. Our chi squared left, we go down to 17 again, and we look at 0.975. What's that tell us? Um, you should know which one's your boundary on your left and which one's your boundary on your right just by looking at the numbers. Which one has to be farther to the left? The 7. The seven. This one has to be farther to the right. right. So what we're looking at no negative stuff. It's this graph, the tail on the right. We're saying that this boundary over here is 7.564. This boundary over here is 30.191. And we're saying that 95% of all the information should fall within that range. All right? What's the percentage out here? 2.5, what's the percentage out here? 2.5. To do a confidence interval for variance, to do a confidence interval, write this down. This is going to tell you how to do the confidence interval. Very, very important. This part right here, I'll tell you what, we'll write it like this because this will make more sense to you guys. Instead of writing it out with the alligator mouse, if you write it like this, n minus 1 in parentheses times s squared divided by chi squared right, and on this side it's n minus 1 times s squared divided by chi squared left. I don't care if you write it this way with the alligator mouse or if you write it the way we've been doing everything else. That's totally up to you. I'll know either way. Alright, since we've been doing the parentheses more, that might be better just to keep everything constant. Now Daniel might say, no, I want to do this one different. I want to write it with the alligator mouse so I don't get it confused with the other ones. I don't know. It's up to you guys.
They're going to tell you N, they're going to tell you S, and then we're going to have to do the calculations and find the chi-squared left, chi-squared right so that we can do the calculations. So Michael was complaining that he did everything out longhand last time. Michael, is that going to hurt you now? You know how to do it, so it's basically the same thing. But this one you have to do out longhand. So I'm saying that, all right, now you already know it, so that should make this easier. Benjamin asked me how to do it, so I told him how to do it long way. It's, it's the exact same thing. Just find the E and then subtract it from the P and then add it to the B to get the two. That's I guess. It's not that bad, but it's just. It took a lot longer. I don't think it takes that much longer. It don't take that much longer. Punch it into the calculator every Why? Well, I had everything to clear, so I would like punch it. I did like the exact decimal I around the office. That's the A. Uh, the last thing down here for standard deviation, that formula that you just wrote down, for standard deviation all you do is what? Square. Take the, close, take the square root of the two sides. So what you have in your parentheses there, you're going to take the square root of the one on the left, take the square root of the one on the right, and that's going to be your interval for your standard deviation. So once you find the, bar uh, the interval for the variance, if you're trying to find the interval for the standard deviation, you just take the square root of the two. And that's going to give you the interval for the standard deviation. Exact same as everything else we've done all year long. Uh, now, you got to remember if your calculator did do this for you, which it doesn't, and I'm still not lying to you. If it did do it for you, it would tell you this one, and you'd have to go the other way. That's why Sean said what he said earlier, because he said it backwards. If your calculator did do it for you, it would probably tell you the standard deviation. And to get the variance, you'd have to do what to each part? Square, the square each part, instead of going this way. If you're doing out longhand, you're going to find the variance first. And then to find the standard deviation, you take the square root of it. So making the confidence interval, it's got to be normal. They'll tell you that every time. You're going to find your DF. S squared is this. Probably most of the time, they're going to tell you what S or S squared is. Now here you've got to be careful. If they tell you S, then in this formula, what do you got to do to that S? You got to square it. So sometimes they're going to tell you S equals 7.2. Then when you put it in here, you're going to have to square it. Other times they're going to tell you S squared equals, and then you're not going to have to square it. So you got to read the problem carefully and know which one you're doing. 
You're going to have to find the critical values. You find those critical values by using your chart and using the uh, 1 minus C divided by 2 and the 1 plus C divided by 2 and the degrees of freedom. This is going to give you the interval for uh, your chi-squared. Then if you want just, not chi-squared, for sigma-squared. And then if you want just sigma, the interval for the standard deviation, you'll have to take the square root of both sides. be something like this on the homework. You may have to find S yourself. If you have to find S yourself, it's because they give you a big long list of numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on, so on, so on. And you got to put that in a list on your calculator and do the one variable stats and then find the SX and then use that in the problem. So you may have to find uh, that standard deviation using your calculator, the one variable stats thing, if they give you a big long list. Otherwise, they'll probably tell you what S is or what S squared is. This is the last section in this chapter, so we'll have a test next week. Does anybody remember this formula? We ought to go back and start doing that chapter again, like chapter two. We should go back and redo it and do it all longhand, shouldn't we? With the big long charts. That'd be okay if it's only like rest of the year. Just do that. Yeah. We might do that. We get new grades for it? Yeah. All right, yeah. So you're going to have to do it all longhand, no calculators. And when it comes to test time, I'm taking all your calculators. For what? Just let's do proofs again. So like yeah, let's do two column proofs. Let's do like one proof a day. Turn smack it. I'm getting ready to. I'm you're, you're, very, stuff. you're very fair. Stuff about this class? Yes, it is. I'm trying to figure out how to put it on my calculator. <laughs> because it's not on there. All right, on this, we're going to do this one. I know I got it done up here, but we're going to do it out separately out here. It says, you randomly select and weigh 30 samples of uh, allergy medicine. Uh, the sample standard deviation is 1.2 milligrams. Assuming, assuming the weights are normally distributed, construct a 99% confidence interval for the population. So our C is 0.99. This is probably the last thing that we'll get done. Uh, our S is 1.2. So anybody know when you're talking about any kind of medicine, what's 1.2 milligrams mean? When you see that on a package or something, what's it telling you? of whatever kind of medicine it is. Not, not that the pill weighs 1.2 milligrams. Yeah, it's how much is in that. How much of medicine's in there because there's other things in there other than just yeah. medicine. There's other stuff in there, stuff that helps the medicine maybe not taste so bad or whatever. Not to upset your stomach and stuff like that. Uh, so our C is 0.99. What's our N this time? 30. 30. 
If n is 30, first thing we got to do every single time, find df. What's df? 29. 29. All right. Now, we're going to do this. Again, every single time. 1 minus, what's our c? 0.99 divided by 2, and 1 plus 0.99 divided by 2. Somebody help me out and do that top one. 1 minus 0.99 divided by 2. 0.005. And what's that mean the other one is? Now, once we have that, we're going to use our DF and these two numbers and our chart to find our chi squared right and our chi squared left. So on your chart, find 29, go down to 29. I'm hoping 29's on there. Is 29 on there? Yeah. Go down to 29, go over to 0 .005, what's it tell you? 52.336. Go down to 29, go over to 0.995, and what's it tell you? 13.121. Those are our critical values. Once we have our critical values, to do our interval, the formula for the interval Somebody help me out because I don't remember the whole formula. It's n minus 1 times s squared divided by what? x to the r. Chi squared right, and on the other side it's the same thing, but divided by chi squared left. So when we plug into this formula, n minus 1, we've already done that. What was n minus 1? So I'm just going to write down 29 times What's our S? 1.2. But what are we going to have to do to it this time? Square, square it. Divided by, what was our chi squared right? 52.336. And then on the other side, it's 29 times squared over what? Now the way that I try to remember when I'm doing this, I always want to divide by the bigger number on this side because this is where our smaller number should end up in our interval. Divide by the smaller number on this side because this is where our bigger number should end up because we're going from small up to big for our interval. Somebody do all that on their calculator and tell me what we come up with. Point 0.798. On that side? Anybody else get that? She didn't sound too sure. Um. Yeah. All right. Now, with this, there shouldn't be any way that you can punch this into your calculator wrong. If you punch it in 29 times 1.2 squared divided by 52.336, the you can punch it all in as one thing, the calculator will do it all. How about on the other side? 3.183. Anybody else get that? Yeah. This is the interval for our what? Variance. Our variance. Sigma squared. That's the interval for the variance. If we don't want the variance, if we want the standard deviation, we take the square root of both of them. So somebody help me out. What's the square root of 0 0.798? 0 0.893. 0.893. What's the square root of 3.183? 1.784. Those are our two intervals. So we're saying that the variance of the pills should fall from 0.798 to 3.183. It should fall within that interval. The standard deviation, how much each pill should 
deviate from the mean should be no more than 0.893 to 1.7, which is an awful wide standard deviation for this because if we're deviating by 1.784, well, if you put, if the sample is 1.2 milligrams, well, we're up to almost 3 milligrams. That's, that's a lot of deviation there. How come it's such a big deviation? We're 99% confident that it's going to fall within that range. Probably if you're doing medicine like that, we're probably going to try to shrink that down because we don't want to all of a sudden it throw in there three milligrams and find out that, oh yeah, that killed somebody or something because they took too much at one time. And, uh, that's not the way it works. That's your assignment, page 341. It's extremely long, it's like 50 problems.